Hello and welcome back to Mr. Shaw's Dumb Podcast on AP Gov, covering today FRQs. Uh, okay, so before I do the FRQs, I want to make sure that everybody knows about a resource that is available to you. Uh, this is called a cram chart for 2021, and it is from fiveable.me. Uh, they are the sponsors of this video. They're not actually sponsors, to be clear. I'm not making any money. Regardless, um, what I wanted you to know is that this is going to be a really good resource for you as you are preparing this weekend. Again, it's got, I'll, let me zoom in here for you so you can kind of see. Again, it's going to go over each of the unit, units, um, covering some of the biggest things from each unit. Um, so my, what I would recommend doing is going through each of these, each and every unit here, and putting a star by the things that you need more help with. Uh, again, my thing, you put a check mark by the things that you feel good about, and then put a star by the things you want to learn more about. And then after you have your stars, go check your notes, and then uh, also make sure, or you go to, you can maybe look up some, some sources on the internet, um, you know, or, or check your notes or your book or, or what have you. Uh, again, so this is on Canvas, uh, for Shaw's class, it's under an announcement. Uh, for Ms. Womack's class, it will either be under an announcement or under resources. Uh, and actually, I might put it under resources too, just to make your lives easier. Okay, again, that is your cram chart. Again, that is there for you. That's going to be a huge help to you this weekend. Okay, uh, guys, getting into the FRQs today, some, this is going to be pretty short and sweet. I'm not going to go over some potential examples uh, because Ms. Womack, so this is what I'm going to cover today, and of course they look similar. Um, sorry. Uh, this is what Ms. Womack made. Uh, again, this is going to have all of the, uh, it's, it's going to do some similar things as, that, as to what I'm going to do today, uh, but it has templates on here for you. Uh, it's going to have uh, some, some specific examples. Uh, and then you can either even use have a head of space for you to write your your own response, uh, and then also some possible answers for you. Uh, so again, that is on Canvas. That is not exactly what I'm going to do today. I just wanted to kind of be more short and sweet uh, because let's face it, we are down to the wire. Uh, so let's get to it. AP Gov FRQs. Here we go. Okay, so the FRQs, you have 140 minutes, that is 100 minutes total, um, in order to write four FRQs. They will be written all together okay, in that 100 minutes. Uh, it is not, did I say 140 minutes? It should be, I think it should be 100, 100 minutes, an hour and 40 minutes, I apologize. Uh, again, you're gonna have, they're gonna give that, that big chunk of time and you are going to complete all four FRQs in that time. It will always be in the same order. It will always go concept application, quantitative analysis, SCOTUS comparison, and then argumentative essay. Uh, so here to start, we have just a few tips for you. Uh, number one, be sure to separate and label each section of your answer with a space. Uh, again, when I, I mean, you guys are gonna be writing these out in pen, so more specifically, what I want you to do is after you, if you answer part A, I want you to leave a space, like a literally a line between your answer for A and then your answer for B. Again, the, the, the more organized you are, the more likely you are to get points. I cannot stress this enough. The people who are grading your essays are human beings. They, if you are more, the more organized you are, the more likely they are to give you the benefit of the doubt and to give you points where you may not have, you know, act, you know, maybe you were a little bit vague in a certain area, they might be likely to give you that point uh, if you are more organized and it is clear what you are doing. Okay, so I just told you to label things. So this is gonna be kind of counterintuitive, but just bear with me. So number two, after you have completed your FRQ, I want you to cross out the labels, meaning the A, B, C, and D. The only, S, the only essay I would not cross your labels out for is the argumentative essay. Uh, again, that is because it's not, uh, I, I, I want you to be as clear as possible with the, the argumentative essay. 
Um, but the reason I have you cross out the labels is because this is a visual cue to the grader that they can look for your answers anywhere in your writing. Now, again, just as a side note, uh, they should be doing this anyway. Like, for example, with your thesis, if, you're, if you have a really bad thesis at the very beginning of your essay, but you have a really good thesis with a good line of reasoning at the end of your essay, you should be getting the thesis point anyway. Okay, so, but, but again, if you cross out the labels, um, like they are going to be more likely to be looking for your, um, your answers anywhere within your essay. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, all right, so the set third thing is to be as specific as possible, but make sure you know your stuff. Do, uh, again, in general, you need to be as specific as you can, but if you are not sure on something, uh, again, don't, you know, don't necessarily, you don't want to be just spouting facts that you're just like coming up with off the top of your head. Again, you want to make sure uh, that you are being as specific as you can, uh, and that is going to come from having a really good content knowledge, which is really my, one of my biggest things to focus on. Rather than even practicing FRQs, I would focus on the content. And because if you know the content well, uh, the FRQs are going to take care of themselves. That is my pro tip down there. Uh, for number five, again, for number four, uh, I, Ms. Womack and I are really, uh, are, are not quite as, as, as strict with this as we should be, but you should definitely be writing in complete sentences. Uh, again, even if it says identify something, you should have an entire sentence for them. If it says identify the most common level of education spending, you should, you should answer it as the most common level of education spending is blank. Okay. Um, again, I already mentioned my pro tip for number five. If you know your content, the FRQs will take care of themselves. Again, use the cram chart, use the packets that we've been filling out in class, you guys will be fine. Number six, this is kind of a, a, a random one here. So since they, they, the College Board suggests that you take 20 minutes for each of the first three FRQs, and then 40 minutes for the argument invested. Uh, I want to just remind you that all FRQs are weighted the same, meaning that they each count towards 25% of your total FRQ grade. Okay, so just keep that in mind that if you, yes, you should spend more time on the argument essay because it is more difficult. Uh, however, you don't necessarily, it doesn't actually mean more. So while you're, when you're thinking about that, make sure that you are maximizing your time in the other three FRQs uh, and, and not necessarily taking, you know, you shouldn't take any longer than 40 minutes to write your argument essay. Okay, questions on my, on my tips? Okay, I, for those of you listening at home, I assure you that there are people here. It's not just me pretending to talk to a room, an empty room. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. All right, let's get to the concept application. Okay, this is our first FRQ. It is, again, I suggest taking about 15 to 20 minutes, and it is content heavy. And when I, what I mean by that is that it is looking for very specific answers uh, regarding, regarding the scenario and the content. So, uh, the, your task for the concept application is to relate a scenario to class concepts. Each section relates to the previous one. So again, A, your answer for part A, you're going to use that in part B, and you're going to build on both of those in part C. Again, you'll see here, like in my example, describe a power of Congress, and then in part B, it says explain how the use of that congressional power described in part A can be affected by its interaction with the presidency. Again, you're building here. And then part C, it says, again, explain how the interaction between Congress and the president, again, that is referring to your answer in part B, can be affected by linkage institutions. So again, it all builds on each other. So the most important thing to answer here is part A. You need to make sure that you are knocking part A out of the park with a very specific answer that is, uh, is easy to build off of. And I will go into what I mean by that in a second. So for the concept application, it's not, it's really not easy to prepare you for what the actual questions will be because they're not necessarily always going to be the same. 
I believe they will all pretty much always look like this, like you see them here, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Okay, I've seen other ones from College Board that are that are, are worded in different manners, but I believe that this is how it should look. So what I wanted to do instead was I wanted to talk about the key words that you are going to be seeing throughout all of your FRQs, okay, and kind of what to expect from all of these. So if it asks you to identify, that is the easiest one, it literally means just name something. Now, remember my, my pro tip from the previous slide, you need to be using complete sentences. Uh, again, so, so again, that's the easiest one. Part B is describe. Again, when you are describing something, you need to tell me what something is, meaning I need to know some characteristics about that thing that it's asking about. Okay, so that's going to be a little bit harder. So again, an identify can be done in one sentence. A describe should probably be somewhere in like the two to four sentences range. Maybe two to three would be better. And, and this would be good to add to your notes on this. Um, for C, the explain is to you need to describe and establish relevance, meaning I want you to make connections when you are explaining something. Okay, so again, you're going to talk about talk about explaining. Um, I, I, again, that's the hardest one. It should be anywhere from about probably like three to maybe six sentences. If, if it's asking you to explain, you definitely cannot do that in one to three sentences. You should def, should be going more in depth at at all possible times. Okay, so number four, my that my fourth point here is this is the only one that's super specific about its wording, uh, and it says in the context of the scenario. So when, when you see these, these, these words here, like you do in parts B and C in my example, you have to link your answer to the scenario or you will get no points. So what I, I have told my kids a lot is for the concept application, you need to make sure that you are basically linking, linking your answers to the scenario for, all a, for every answer, A, B, and C. Even if it doesn't say in the context of the scenario, you should be describing the scenario and talking about what it, what is relevant about it or anything like that. Okay, you want to make sure you have some link to the scenario. Again, or else you won't get any points. Questions on what I went over? All right. Questions? Yes. Uh, so again, the question was, are we going to go through the examples? And the answer is yes. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at this example. So it says, consumers complained after EpiPen maker Mylan uh, hiked the price of the emergency auto injector by $100 in recent months for no obvious reason. The price has increased 450% since 2004 when a dose cost $100 in today's dollars to its current price of more than, more than $600. The medication itself isn't expensive, Analysts calculate that the dosage contained in a single pen is worth about one dollar. That's from the Washington Post, 2016. Okay, question? No. Oh, okay. Okay, so again, guys, think think super specific. Again, uh, you're just gonna, you're gonna start with a uh, power of Congress in this scenario, but it doesn't have to always be a power of Congress. Yeah, and I'll, I'll post this tonight. Okay, uh, so again, describe a power of Congress, uh, a power, power of Congress to you to address the comments outlined in the scenario. What do you got? Uh, I, I, yes, they, they have power. That's not, the, somebody said Commerce Clause. Again, I would I would be more specific. Like, what does Congress actually do? Yes. Okay. So again, I think your go-to here again in for, for, for Congress, I would keep, I would stay really simple with them. Okay. So if they can, they, in this case, the best thing that they could do is pass a law that would regulate the price of epipens. Okay. And again, me, me mentioning those epipens, that is linking to the scenario. Okay. So that would probably get, and again, I would probably go one sentence further and say, now companies like Milan can't raise the price over a certain level if I set if we set a ceiling for the price of epipens based on the congressional law. Okay, so that is that described 
hey, again, I'm looking for a more, more than just one sentence that you went, and I think we have done that again. You pass a law and you talk about what that law would actually do. Right? Questions there? Yes, yes. So the, the question was for when I say uh, the, in, in the context of the scenario or you see the word scenario, um, do I want you to actually like use words and, 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 issue, and things from the scenario? And the answer is yes. Like you should, like I am talking about specifically EpiPens, or you could talk, like, talk about the auto injector. You could, I talked about the company Mylon as well. Those things are going to link you to the, uh, to, to the scenario and they would, they would give you the point for that. Right. All right, so part B, in the context of the scenario, explain, again, you see that word explain, we're gonna to need to go more in depth here. How the use of congressional power described in part A can be affected by its interaction with the presidency. Okay, so again, we used, in part A, we used passing the law uh, what is, again, how can the president respond? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you're, you're a stat, I, I love the explanations that you're, that you're using. Like you're you're going more in depth off of, off of that. Like again, in the biggest case, I would just say the president can respond to this to this law or this potential law by either signing it into law or vetoing it um, outright and preventing it from becoming a, a law. Again, since we're explaining, you might want to get into why the president would do one of those two things. So, for example, um, he would sign. And we're talking about business regulation right now. Okay, we're about regulating business. What party is going to be in favor of business regulation? Democrats, exactly. Okay, so in this case, if the president were to sign the bill, it may be that Congress and the president were of the same party. They were both Democrats and were in favor of, of, uh, of more business regulation. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So the question was, could we, could you say something about the bureaucracy here and are the president uh, talking about the bureaucracy? Uh, I think that the answer is yes, you could. Um, you, you would probably just want to acknowledge that the president could, would have to sign the bill into law first. Um, and then, but in that case, it would almost be like a two part answer for part B. You could say additionally, the president could then direct the, the FDA uh, for how he wants them to actually implement this law. Um, talking about the actual ceilings, you know, however you want to do that, talk about what, what regulations he want, actually wants in place. I think that's a good thing to talk about as well. Okay. Um, the other, so again, if, and then again, of course, if you, if you wanted to go with the veto route, the, the president might be Republican in that case and not uh, in favor of business regulation. And then again, if we have a Democratic Congress and a Republican president, what can we talk about? Divided government, exactly, okay. Hi, welcome, come on in. Um, so the, uh, again, the, the thing here, guys, there's, there's a lot of ways to take here. Again, I would just, I would, I would stick to, um, stick to what, you know, what you know just make sure when you're explaining, you want to go further. You notice that it didn't say a thing about parties. It didn't say a thing about, um, you know, the like presidential beliefs or divided government, but those are all things that are related. So that is something that I wanted to include. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So then part C, in the context of the scenario, explain how the interaction between Congress and the presidency can be affected by linkage institutions. Okay. So now, Guys, linkage institutions are a really powerful thing to know about. I want you to know a lot about them, and I really hope that they ask you about linkage institutions because you have four options to choose from, and it allows you a lot more flexibility. So the four linkage institutions are media, political parties, campaigns and elections, and interest groups. So there's a way, a, 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 like any, you know, there's a lot of different things that you can go about here, but you see that it says explain again. 
So whatever you're explaining, you whatever you choose, you need to make sure that you're making connections. Okay? You need to make sure that you are, are, are going above and beyond when you're seeing that explained. Okay, question? Okay, let, let me handle the answer here just because I don't want to take, I, I mean, I, just because in general there's a lot of different ways to go. Uh, so I, let me just, what I would do for, for media, for media, I would focus on influencing public opinion. For campaigns and elections, I would focus on how the president is going to use public opinion to get reelected. So, for example, if the uh, if polling showed that this was a popular bill, a popular law to pass, that more people wanted more government regulation, then the president is more likely to pass it because he wants to get reelected okay, in the in his coming campaign. Again, assuming that he has not already run for two terms. Okay, um, same thing for Congress here. Actually, in Congress might even be a better way to approach it because there's no term limits for Congress. And also, they, they also are going to need to get reelected. So uh, also, you could, you could even take a, uh, a campaign donation sort of situation here. Milan probably has an interest group, okay? And they can donate, because of Citizens United, they can donate unlimited amounts of money to campaigns uh, through, or through political action committees, or sorry, uh, super PACs. So they, it, like, again, by passing this law, they, they might be angering Milan and, and losing, especially like maybe Republicans, would be losing campaign donations, and they are going to need to find ways to, to replace those. Uh, Democrats, I, I, again, they might be getting, I, I couldn't imagine, it'd be harder for them. Um, I would focus more on the public opinion with them, like, because they are, that, that's not exactly, uh, I don't know, the same ballpark. Uh, but again, for, for campaigns and elections, focus on getting reelected, focus on popularity of ideas and the public opinion, um, and then maybe even like transferring things from public opinion to public policy. For uh, polit political parties are kind of a hard one. I would focus on platforms of parties um, and specifically trying to implement a policy agenda that is relevant to the party's platform. Okay, and then also you could talk, because parties do a lot to support candidates. They also are going to, you know, provide funding. They might provide endorsements. Uh, so if they disagree, like the Republicans in this case, if any Republican voted in favor of this bill, the Republican Party as a whole might actually lose favor with them, and they may not make full support from them in the next election. Okay, or that's something that the political parties could do. And then you would want to get into why they would want to do that, the Republican Party platform is more laissez-faire. They're in favor of deregulation, things like that. The last one is interest groups. And of the four guys, I think interest groups is one of the biggest ones to know. Media is an easy one, but I would, I think interest groups, knowing interest groups and, and knowing them like the back of your hand is going to be much more uh, relevant to you because it is, uh, it's going to pop up everywhere. It's going to pop up in iron triangles. It's going to pop up uh, you know, just in policy in general. So make sure for uh, for interest groups, you know, lobbying and electioneering are the two biggest things that they do. They can lobby Congress to pass this bill or to veto or to, you know, kill this bill. Um, and again, you would want to explain why they would want to do that. So for example, if it was a, my, if it was my lawn, uh, or if it was an interest group representing companies, then they might want, they might want to kill it because this is going to be very bad for profits. If it was a, um, you know, if it was an interest group representing the needs of, you know, people with peanut allergies, I don't, I don't know. Um, there's probably an interest group about that. Uh, that then again, they're going to want to, they're going to be lobbying in favor of that, um, and and wanting to do this because it's going to directly help the, uh, the the constituents in this interest group. Uh, and again, they, for the electioneering, I would just say where where they would support, who they would support, uh, would be the best way to go for me. Specifically, like they might throw their support behind, you know, uh, candidates that are going, you know, peak Republican, or sorry, like um, people like Milan, interest groups like Milan would then maybe throw their support to other candidates that 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 want deregulation, um, and and they could donate money to those. They could, you know, uh, put ads, release ads for those, all kinds of stuff. Okay, I've talked a lot about this one. Do we have any questions about this one? Yeah. OK, 
Okay, the question was about um, linking uh, like like the regulations of uh, of the EpiPens uh, to uh, like the idea more the idea of a social program, which we're going to be more in favor of, or Democrats will be more in favor of, uh, and I think that that is a fine a fine route to take here. Okay, so let's move on. Next up is the quantitative analysis, uh, and I apologize for my kids. I didn't have a, a better example. This was like the best quantitative analysis question that I have. Um, so I wanted to make sure you guys had it. Again, this was one that we did in class. This is our second FRQ. Uh, College Board recommends about 20 minutes. Uh, it is mostly analysis. Most of it is going like uh, part A and B. Half of it is really just analysis, and even part C, a little bit is analysis. So. Um, you're, this is kind of a, even if you don't know anything about AP government, you can usually get a points for parts A and B. Okay, so that's really good. Make sure you don't, uh, don't mess up on those. All right, uh, so your task here is to relate an infographic to class concepts. Again, it can be a chart, it can be a graph, um, it can be really anything right, that, that, that falls into this category. Uh, again, part A is going to ask you to identify something in the stimulus. Again, you need complete sentences, but for part A, you only need to write one sentence. So again, don't, don't overdo it there. For part B, you're going, you're going to need to describe a pattern, trend, similarity, or difference from the stimulus. Again, you want to do what it says. Okay, it's either got like, in, for example, in our, our example here, it says describe a similarity or difference. It could say describe a pattern. It could say describe a trend. Remember, if you're describing something, you are, you need to give me characteristics about it. You need to tell me about it. It is more than just identifying. Part C, oh, I'm sorry. And, and the other thing, too, for part B, is I would not go with the first one you pick. I have the first one, the first like similarity or difference pattern or trend that you see. I would take a second here and I would think about a good one that or something that's going to be easy to conclude off of. Okay, so for example, like in, and I'm going to show, I'll show you how to do this in my when I do Part B here. Um, but again, you want to make sure that you're picking a, a, a pattern, trend, similarity, or difference that is easy to draw a conclusion from. That's just a pro tip for this one. Um, for part C, you're going to, B and C are directly related. So C, you're going to draw a conclusion from what you mentioned in part B. This needs to be a mental leap. Don't just reword part B. Okay, this is, this is really tricky, okay, because a lot of people don't go far enough. When you, when I, and so a tip that I have for you here is to don't even say your, make sure that the literal words that you have in part C are different from your part B. You want to make sure that those are different enough that it's you're literally not just restating. Okay? And then the last one is explain how a class concept is shown in the stimulus. Okay, so again, this there's really a lot of flexibility here. We don't know what to expect. Um, but again, it's gonna be you're gonna relate something from the stimulus to a class concept uh, going from there. Okay, questions about the breakdown? Let's get to it. Part A, identify the most common level of education spending by states in the Southeast. Now again, you guys have already done this one. Um, so again, in the Southeast, hey, it's got a nice little compass for you too. How nice. Okay, again, you see in the Southeast over here, uh, the level is gonna be $8,999. Again, I apologize for those of you at home that cannot see that very well. Uh, that is the answer. So you would wanna say the most common level of education spending by states in the Southeast is $8,000 to $9,999. Or for Part B, it says to describe a similarity or difference in public education spending by state or region as illustrated in the information graphic. So again, similarity or difference here, so I'm not doing pattern, patterns or trends. So again, it doesn't matter, you just need to pick one and make sure you pick one. Don't list both, okay? Make sure you pick one and stick to it. Okay, so let me show you an example of a bad one. Hey, this is a bad one, don't do this. So I, again, I'm gonna see, I, right now I look at Texas and I look at Missouri, okay? Missouri and Texas are the same, uh, are the exact same uh, like levels of, of education spending, okay? That's not, again, that, that is true and that is a similarity. However, it's not gonna be easy for me to draw a conclusion based on that. Any conclusion I could say would be something along the lines of 
uh, well, they have, they may, maybe they tax their citizens in similar ways. That's, again, that is accurate, and you could probably, you could probably get away with that, but I don't think that that's the strongest answer. So for me, I really like, I think differences are really the way to go if you have the option between a similarity or difference, because there's, those, those contrasts are going to help you to create a better answer. So for example, let's stick with Texas, and I see Texas and New York in comparison are very, very different, okay? So Texas is in that $8,000 to $9,999 range, and then New York looks like it's in the uh, $14,000 to $15,000, I think, or no, $15,999, yeah. Okay, so that could be my difference, is that Texas spends less money on public education than, or per pupil, uh, rather than New York. Okay, um, again, so then the, the, the difference or the conclusion I can draw from that is that, and now again, you're looking for to take a mental leap here. So again, think, I, I, first of all, how is, how is education funded? Taxes, okay? So again, taxes are a really good thing to start to talk about here. You can talk about, uh, about how the taxes for education in, you can infer that the taxes in, in Texas are lower than the taxes for education in New York. Okay, again, li literally, they have less money to spend. Now, again, if I just said that, that they have less money to spend, that's restating my Part B, and that's not that's not good enough. Okay, so that's why I want you to be careful there, and that's why I want you to take a mental leap. When I talk about taxation, that's different. That's not just education spending. Okay, again, what else can you tell me about that? You what else do you know about the differences between Texas and New York? Okay, uh, population, actually, I think they're probably pretty similar. Political parties and their political views, okay, so that's another good one. So Texas is going to be lean mostly conservative, New York will lean mostly liberal. Now, again, this is really key here because now I'm, I, you can infer that, that Texas is probably a conservative state or a Republican state and that and, and that New York is a, a, uh, a liberal state or a Democrat, they usually vote Democrat, because of their education spending. Democrats are going to be in favor of higher taxes and more spending on social programs like education, okay? whereas conservatives are, are less in favor of that. They want lower taxes and lower government spending. Does that make sense? Okay, so again, you see here that I am, I'm taking these leaps and I'm making connections to things from the, from the, the rest of class. Okay, questions there? Okay, again, those are just a couple of, of examples that you can use. Um, again, just may, I, I make sure you are, are picking a strong, uh, a strong thing for Part B, and you have thought ahead of time. I would honestly take five minutes. I would take five minutes. I would start brainstorming potential answers to Part B and what their conclusions could be. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, all right, and then lastly for Part D, it says, explain how public education spending, as shown in the information graphic, demonstrates the principle of federalism. Okay, so we're back to that explain word. So I'm looking for more, I'm looking to make those connections. I'm looking for you to, um, to uh, definitely just go in more in depth. Again, you see that federalism? You need to define that. That's a, again, that's a bit, uh, explain is describing and establishing relevance and making connections. So again, I would I would describe federalism. Okay, uh, more again in this case you're talking about the separation or the division of, of government powers between a, a national and a state government or state governments rather. Uh, that is federalism, and then you're going to want to talk about how federalism is shown here. So again, why do we know, or well, what can you tell me about about how this relates to federalism? I wouldn't book I wouldn't focus on that because that's going to get confusing. Like if you said so, the, the, the what was stated was that states and federal governments spend money on education. I you're, you are correct. Um, however, that is not the, the the route I would take because that does not mesh well with uh, the the federalism definition. Unless you're talking about cooperative federalism, which is another thing you can do. However, it's not again that is getting that's kind of muddying the waters here. That might be almost too complicated for what you need. Okay. 
Okay, you're you're right, except you said the word denied. So what? So you would say you would want to say that so education is not listed as an enumerated power in the Constitution. Therefore, because of the Tenth Amendment, it is left to the states. And the states, since they have the authority to determine how much money they are going to spend on education, they choose different levels. If this was a an enu if education was an enumerated power, then most likely all states would have the same amount of education spending. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, what I just said there would be a perfect example. I'm making connections. I'm talking about different things. I'm, I'm even going as far as to like the theorizing what would happen if education was a federal power. Okay. Did you, so that, again, the more you can do that, the better. Okay, guys, finishing up on the quantitative analysis here. I, this is a really easy one. So just a quick little tip, just make sure you guys are listening. The, uh, if, if you look at the concept application question and you are completely stumped, like you have no idea or you know it's going to take a lot more time, I would go, I, I would just, again, you don't have to do this. This is just what I would do. If it looks really like it's going to be really challenging, I would skip ahead to the quantitative because that's going to be some easy wins for me. Okay, A and B are going to be super straightforward, and that's going to kind of get my get, get the ball rolling, get some success under my belt, okay, and then kind of start moving forward. Um, again, the concept application also is the most specific question or the most specific content required. So if you you can if it, if it looks like it's going to be pretty complicated, skip it and come back to it. All right. Next up is the SCOTUS comparison. All right, so this is our third FRQ. Again, College Board suggests about 20 minutes for it. Um, you just, again, fair, in, in all fairness here, if this is going to require a really good SCOTUS knowledge, specifically of the required cases, and the and, and really good knowledge of the Constitution. Uh, again, the, the good part, guys, the, the, what, what I told my kids today is that the, one of the easiest ways to prepare for the SCOTUS comparison is just to start memorizing the background and decisions of the required the 15 required court cases and the and memorizing the constitutional clauses involved. If you're doing that, you're all you are helping yourself out in other ways too. You're like for, with the clauses, you're getting a better knowledge of the constitution. With the, the court cases, you're helping yourself out for a, an, an FRQ and for the multiple choice. Okay, and I would suggest the same thing for the Federalist, or for the, sorry, for the required documents. I'm going to say the exact same thing here again when I talk about that as so the argument essay. Okay, so your task for the SCOTUS comparison is to compare a required case to a new case. Okay, the stimulus is the background and decision of the new case. Okay, so you're not going to get, it's not going to give you a, re a required case background and decision. You're supposed to know that. That's why, again, it's going to be well worth your time to make sure you guys are memorizing those 15 cases. Okay, so part A is always going to be the same. It's going to say identify the common constitutional principle in both cases. Okay, again, you're looking, you're, and it's going to tell you. So like in your example, see, you see the ones that we have here is McCullough v. Maryland and the, and the provided case is Arizona v. United States. Okay, so you're looking for the common constitutional principle. Again, what, when you see McCullough v. Maryland, the, 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 the ones, the, the clauses that you have memorized should be popping into your head. So again, what, which ones are you thinking? Don't say anything, Britton. What, what are the two clauses from McCullough v. Maryland? The, the National Bank one. Supremacy in Alaska, okay? So it's going to, the answer for part A here has to be one of those two. Okay, so that's that's really good, and that's why memorizing the case, the four cases, guys, is going to be so uh, is going to be so important. Um, okay, so that's part A. Part B, the, the the thing you're answering is why do the facts lead to similar or different holdings? Again, let me read the uh, let me read the part B here because this is going to help. Again, this is a two part question here. So it, it says, explain how the facts of McCullough v. Maryland and the facts of Arizona v. United States led to a similar holding in both cases. Guys, for the first part, you need to describe the background and decision of the required case. That's your first point for Part B. 
Again, imagine that you are laying a foundation for the rest of your answer. That is exactly what you're doing. Okay, you are going, you're going to talk about, and like in this case, actually, I'll wait, I'm not getting ahead of myself. Okay, so again, you're going to background and decision of the required case. Again, you're not going to have that. You're going to need to pull that out of your brain. Part B, sorry, B2 here is going to, you need to explain why the facts of both cases led to a similar or different holding. And again, you're going to want to do what it says. In this case, it says similar holding. That means that these two cases, McCullough and Arizona, are similar holdings. Okay, and again, remember that a holding is just a fancy word for a decision. Okay, don't get caught up on that. Um, so for part and, and I'll, so part B, um, I already, I, 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 well, again, I, I'll get to the rest. Let me explain part C, and then we'll go back and just do this one. Okay, so again, it says for part C, explain an action a political entity could take if it disagreed with the decision in the new case. I've also seen it say, what could they do to limit its impact? The, the impact of the holding in the new case. I've seen both of those. Be sure, again, it's the same question, essentially. It's just worded differently. Quick, real quickly, again, some political entities can include Congress, the president, interest groups, uh, et cetera. Again, the people could be included in that. Uh, the media may be. I mean, there's all kinds of political entities, but just keep in mind that there's a lot of flexibility here, and they can give you any one thing. So I would really just know maybe one thing or two things that each of these specific entities can do. Uh, pro tip here, make sure you guys are focusing on the checks and balances charts that we have made throughout the class. Okay, specifically the one between Congress, President, and the Judicial Branch. Those are in your notes, those are in your book. You can also Google those. And I just, if you just Google checks and balances chart, you're going to get a good one, okay? Most likely, that's going to help you out uh, on, on this, this question. Again, more than likely, it's probably gonna be asking you about Congress or the President. But again, interest groups, the people, the media, uh, those are all acceptable um, options as well that, that, could, that could pop up. Okay, any questions about our breakdown? Okay, two good questions that were just asked. Uh, the first one is, should part A be one sentence? And the, uh, the answer is yes, kind of. Um, because again, you're, I, it's asking you to identify something. Uh, I, myself, I would get into the habit of defining the, the, the constitutional principle as well. So like, for example, we said that in, in McCullough, it's either going to be supremacy or uh, necessary and proper. So like say it's necessary and proper, you would want to say the common constitutional principle is, or, or common to both cases, is the necessary and proper clause. But then I would go ahead and define that real quick and just say, meaning that Congress can make all laws necessary and proper to run the country. Okay, I would, so again, I, I think you can get away with just doing the sentence, but I think that it is better if you uh, also define the clause. Second question, I'm forgetting it now. What was the question? Oh, yes, okay. So again, the, the confusing part, of part about part B, oops, sorry, let me go back, is that it doesn't, you need to describe the, the background and decision of the required case, and it doesn't specifically or explicitly say that in part B. So you need to be careful and make sure that you know that that is, is happening anyway. So I would put in your notes, as you guys are taking these notes, I would put a huge star by this to describe the background and decision of the required case. It's not going to explicitly say that, but you need to know that that is what it is asking you to do. Uh, again, also, just so you know, I don't have it here, but underneath each of your questions, it's going to have a section that says a good response should, right? And that in the good response should section, it will say, you need to describe the background and or it'll say describe the facts of the required case. Okay. All right. Good. All good questions. Let's go ahead and let's get to it. Let's see if I can read this tiny font from so far away. Okay. So in in 2010, Arizona passed a law that sought to reduce the number of undocumented immigrants in the state. Uh, the law made it a crime to seek or obtain work in the state without proper documentation. And it also made hiring, sheltering, or transporting undocumented people illegal. It also gave the local law enforcement the authority to require proof of residency in the course of a lawful arrest. 
and it gave them the authority to perform warrantless stops of people they suspected of being undocumented. Okay, so then the United States Department of Justice challenged the state law as an interference with the national government's enumerated powers to regulate and enforce immigration law in, sorry, regulate and enforce immigration law. In Arizona, the United States, the Supreme Court agreed with the United States in a five to three decision uh, stating most of the provisions of the law did, did conflict with federal authority. The court said the government of the United States has broad, undoubted power over the subject of immigration and the status of aliens. The authority rests in part on the national government's constitutional power to establish a, a uniform rule of naturalization and its inherent power as sovereign to control and conduct relations with foreign nations. Okay, so what is it? Okay, part A is supremacy clause. Again, we have a conflict between an, an Arizona law and a federal and the federal ability to control naturalization and immigration and things like that. Okay, so if we answer for part A, again, you want to say the, the common constitutional principle is the supremacy clause, which means that the federal government and it, the, con the Constitution and its laws are supreme over state law or take precedence over state law. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, part B. Explain how the facts of McCullough and v. Maryland and the facts of Arizona v. United States led to a similar holding in both cases. Again, I want you to say, you know, so for, again, part B, we need to talk about McCullough first. So you need to talk, again, I, I don't know how super specific I would get. I would just say for me, for McCullough, the national government established a national bank in Maryland. They, Maryland did not believe that that was within the powers of the federal government. They, you can, at, at that point in time, you could mention the taxation if you wanted to, that they, the Maryland tried to tax the bank to try to get it to close, um, and they, they didn't pay the tax, and that was what, what originally brought them to court. I don't think that that's super necessary. As long as you have, they establish a bank, Maryland didn't think that was within its powers, I think that's fine. But then you need to have the decision. So the Supreme Court decided the two things, that the, um, the, the Congress has all powers necessary and proper to run a country, and the national bank falls within that power, and the federal law is supreme over state law. Okay? That's your decision. That's all I would do for Part B1. Okay? You would, that would get you the point. Okay, questions there? Uh, the question was, if we didn't mention the elastic clause here about the necessary and proper, would you still get the point for the for Part B1? And I think the answer is yes, because the elastic clause does not uh, necessarily apply to this case. I would just be very thorough because my name's Mr. Shaw and I have a problem. Okay. Um, all right, so let's get to B2. Again, we need to explain why the facts of both cases led to a similar, or in this case, it's asking for a similar holding. Again, I don't, I'm not, I've already done the facts of McCullough. I've established that base. Now I'm just gonna focus on Arizona. So in this case, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about how we have an Arizona law that conflicts with the constant, or with, with the federal government's power to, and again, you, you're you gonna to wanna to use specific words here. When it says in the second paragraph um, that it has like undoubted power over the subject of immigration and status of aliens, that is an enumerated power. Again, and you, even when, what the Department of Justice said is an interference with the national government's enumerated powers to regulate and enforce immigration law. That's the, those are the words I would use. I would say this law, it, it was a similar holding because in the Arizona, law, the Arizona law conflicted with the enumerated powers of Congress to regulate and enforce immigration law. Okay. Uh, and that is, uh, and, and, and again, based on the sub supremacy clause, I would, again, I would go further. You're explaining here. The, I, would, I, would, I would say because of the supremacy clause, the national government's laws take precedence, and the Arizona laws, uh, uh, you know, the Arizona laws essentially don't, don't, doesn't matter anymore. Okay? They would essentially not exist. They would be essentially unconstitutional. Okay? Questions on Part B? Okay. Part C, sorry. May explain an action that Congress could take to respond to the Arizona of the United States decision if it disagreed with the decision. Okay, 
Um, Congress can do a couple things in regard to the judicial branch. Again, I cannot stress enough, guys, you need to check out your checks and balances chart. Okay, Congress, what can Congress do? Uh, okay, so, good. yes, they can. They can make a law. However, making a law is really, using, using making a law is actually really dangerous for this one because technically the law would conflict with the Constitution. Okay, so if you said you would make a law stating that states could uh, make their own immigration law, that conflicts with the Constitution. Does that make sense? So, so this is actually the only part of, of the, all of the FRQs where saying Congress may be, can pass a law is actually pretty dangerous. Question? In, okay, so that, that's the president, he, that, but it's asking for Congress. Yeah, yeah, so you got to be careful there. Okay, so the, again, be careful. Make sure you do what it asks. Okay, what is yours? Yeah, okay, they could, they could use, okay. So you, what I would want you to say there is that they could use oversight. I don't think that's a good answer. Like, like, so, okay, guys, keep it simple. Keep, keep it simple. The easiest thing, if they disagree with the decision, okay, which, first of all, Congress probably would not disagree with this decision, that, just to be clear. Okay, but regardless, if they did, the, the thing I would go to is the Senate could only confirm justices that disagree with the decision. Okay, that's one. The second thing is they could propose a constitutional amendment that would change how immigration is handled in the United States. Does that make sense? They li literal or, or again, in this case, they could change. I, I don't. I don't think that they would change the. They would change the supremacy clause. That's a really dangerous route to take. But I say. But I would say Pat, pr proposing an amendment, uh, I get granting states the power to determine their own immigration laws. That's a much better. Approach approach okay now but again you see that it says explain so you're going to want to get into the why there why might they want to do that again if you're going to if you this would might be a good time to bring up republicans again and they if you had right, a majority of republicans in congress they are in favor of a smaller federal government and more state power so you could explain you can make a relevant connection here that they might want to do this also republicans tend to be uh, you know, anti-immigration or at least anti-illegal immigration or at least in strong immigration policy. So that would be something that I would I would really harp on here is making a connection to the Republican Party um, because, again, and, and be careful because you really can't make a connection to Democrats here because Democrats would not disagree with the ruling in Arizona. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, okay questions on this one? Again, make sure you're explaining. Make sure that you are making connections when it asks you to explain. The biggest thing I can tell you is to make sure you guys memorize the 15 court cases like the back of your hand. You, I would make flashcards on all of them, on all 15, also on all nine of the required documents. Okay, guys, it's worth it. I promise you. It will pay, pay huge dividends on the test. Okay, the question was, um, for Part C, do I think that the but like controlling the budget is a good answer for what something that Congress can do. I don't think it's the best answer, but I think that you could make it work, and here's why. Um, if, if, if Congress didn't agree with the decision in Arizona, it met, would mean that they would want states to have stronger immigration policy. So the only thing that I could imagine that you could say is they could lower the funding of of the of the like the federal immigration authority, okay, and that means that they would not be able to uh, enforce federal immigration uh, regulations as much, um, which would lead states some perhaps some some room to uh, to kind of you know take more on, on more of a role there. Um, again, that would. I, that action, I don't think that action could be declared unconstitutional because it's not technically, I mean, I guess it's technically a law because it, it's, a it's a budget resolution. I don't know. I, again, not, not a great answer, but I think you might be able to make it work. Okay, any questions on SCOTUS? Any other questions? 
Okay. Yes, it does sound like it. Okay, guys, again, make sure you're studying your court cases. You'll be fine. All right, last essay. The argument essay. Okay, this is the fourth FRQ. It, um, it, it, they suggest about 40 minutes. The biggest thing is you need to know how to structure your essay. The good news for you guys is you guys have been writing argument essays uh, in, with us, obviously, and in ELA for quite a while. So it's pretty similar. The only thing I would need to tell you is that essays and social studies are no fluff, no frills. Just get right down to it, okay? Um, the other thing that you need to know, like the back of your hand for the argument essay, is you need to know the required documents. Guys, I cannot stress enough that the required documents are going to pay huge dividends, knowing that knowing that the, the documents are going to pay huge dividends, not only for the argument essay, but also for the uh, for the multiple choice. Guys, there's nine required documents and 15 required court cases. We know of those 24 things, we know that all of them are going to make an appearance. Okay, so you are essentially setting yourself up for success on at least half of the test if you know those 24 things. Okay, I know that sounds like a lot, but again, it's the things that we've been hitting really hard on all year, so you should be fine. Uh, again, pro tip for the argument essay, are you ready? You gotta outline. Okay. I think that that is going to be the secret here. If you outline your essay, it is going to be a lot easier for you to, first of all, establish a line of reasoning and make sure that your essay even makes sense before you start actually writing. Since you have 40 minutes, I would take the time, maybe even the first 5 to 10 minutes, and I would brainstorm potential answers. Uh, specifically, to start with your thesis, what are some good pieces of evidence that are going to support your thesis, things like that. Okay, yes. Okay, the question was, do you get room to brainstorm on the paper? Uh, I believe the answer is yes, because I think what happens is they have, like, they have the actual prompt, and then they have space, and then I think the lines start on the next page. Uh, but also, you have, they give you plenty of room to write, so you can also just use the first couple lines, and then maybe just cross it out afterwards. Okay, any other general questions about the argument essay? Again, as a reminder, guys, before I get into it, this is still only worth 25% of your, of your FRQ points. Okay, it is worth more points. It is six points, um, and it is longer, but it, again, I cannot stress enough that it is worth the same amount. So when you, if you're talking about maximizing your points, the argument essay is, is worth essentially the same amount as the other three. Okay. So your task is to develop an argument based on a topic from the class. Okay, it's always going to really look the same. Again, the, the things that you need are a thesis, two pieces of specific and relevant evidence. You need explanations about why your evidence supports your thesis. And then you need a rebuttal or a refutation. Okay, uh, you actually can do a, a concession as well. Um, but that would mean that you like, acknowledge that part of your argument is actually weaker. Uh, but I don't recommend doing that because it, it basically pokes holes in your own argument and, and makes you look bad. So don't do that. All right, so let's get to it. So uh, part, for your first one is thesis. And, and also, just, to, just one more thing real quick. I would also re recommend labeling your answers for the argument essay. Is that clear? Okay, I want you to say thesis I want, and then write your thesis. I want you to say evidence one and then write your evidence one. Okay, this is, I think that, that that is helpful for your own, your own organizational purposes, but it's also much easier for your reader to see uh, everything that you're trying to do. Remember, they're human. They are going to be looking to give you any points that they can, but if you're, the more organized you are, the easier that's going to be for them. Okay, so your thesis, it answers the question. You're gonna answer the question. Use, make sure you use the same wording in the prompt and provide a line of reasoning, which is a preview of your evidence. So, um, but I again, I think I'm just going to do this one uh, as kind of as we go here. So let me read. Go ahead and read. I, I, never mind. I'm just going to I'm going to keep going through, and then I'll I'll we'll do this one. So uh, for Part B, Evidence One, if this is a piece of specific and relevant evidence from one of the listed documents. Okay, again, these are they're going to list three required documents for you. Okay, and you're going to need to pick 
at least one for your evidence one. Um, the again, I, I, just a couple couple warnings here. The don't I, again. I, your second piece of evidence can can be another piece of evidence from anywhere, including one of these on the list. But I wouldn't. A lot, a lot of kids get into trouble because they just pick the first two and they're like, okay, we're good. But the problem with that is that Fed, like, just look at these two right here. Fed 10 and Brutus 1 don't mesh at all. They are complete opposites. Okay, so you need to use Fed 10. If you're, and if you're going to use, you know, Fed 10, you need to use another one that's going to support your thesis. Okay, but don't make sure you're, you're, that is clicking in your mind um, as you guys are, are reading these. All right, so for each piece of evidence, you need a warrant, which is you explain how or why your evidence supports your thesis. And again, use the same wording as your thesis. So, guys, if you're going to miss a point on the argument essay, this is where it's going to be. Okay? Kids and adults, for that matter, struggle with backing up their evidence and explaining why it actually supports their argument. So, again, I'm going to show you some specific examples of how to do that when, I, when we go over this. Um, but just keep in mind, you, are, you, are, you have to link your evidence to your thesis. Okay. All right, so now evidence two, I already kind of started this one. This is another piece of specific and relevant evidence, uh, and this can be from anything we have learned about. For example, court cases, other required documents, laws or policies, etc. Okay, so you really have a lot of, of, of wiggle room when it comes to what your second uh, piece of evidence is going to be. So just take your time when you are when you're outlining when you're brainstorming. Make sure you pick one that actually works, okay? and you pick one that's actually going to support your thesis. Okay, again, you're going to do another warrant for your evidence too. And I have you. I think you only actually need to do it once. Don't quote me on that. But the reason I have you do it twice is so that you, if you mess up on the first warrant, you have a second opportunity on the second warrant. Does that make sense? Okay, again, so make sure you do the warrant twice. You want to do two explanations. Question? Good? Okay. All right, so then the last thing is your rebuttal or your refutation. Again, you want to acknowledge an opposing argument with evidence. You want to provide a piece of evidence from that opposing argument and explain why yours is better. Um, again, this is a really great opportunity I can, in any regular conclusion to uh, like summarize your own argument. You're gonna do that in your explanation though. So don't, don't get too cute with that. Just make sure you're acknowledging the opposing argument and then with, that, with a piece of evidence and then explaining why your argument is better. Okay, questions on the outline or the, or the, the breakdown? All right, let's get to it and we'll finish up here. All right, so let me read this one to you. It says, the framers believed that a constitution was necessary to create a stable political system that would protect individual rights. However, understanding the need for political change, they included a process to amend the Constitution. Develop an argument that takes a position on whether the process to amend the United States Constitution should be simplified. And it says, use at least one piece of evidence from one of the following foundational documents. You give us Fed 10, Brutus 1, and Article 5 of the United States Constitution. Now, real quick, I, I, the, one, the articles I always hit really hard in my classes are, are Articles 1, 2, and 3, okay, that are the legis established legislative, executive, and judicial branches, respectively. Um, if you didn't know off the top of your head what Article 5 is, can you guess from the prompt? It's how to amend the Constitution, exactly, okay? So you, so again, use your context clues there. If it gives you something specific, you want to make sure that you are, are, are trying to use your context clues to make sure you know what that is. It might also just say the United States Constitution, and in that case, you could just talk about the amendment process in general. Okay, um, so real quick, the question was, uh, when it's asking for something specific like one of these documents, is it expecting quotations? Again, you don't, you're always going to want to paraphrase when you're using the documents and referring to the documents. Um, more specifically, uh, it, it's going to be good for you to, uh, you know, to, to, to know the documents really, really well. I would know key phrases from each of the documents. Okay, so like for, 
uh, and I'll, I'll talk about these as we go through. Okay, so let's get to it. Um, for my thesis here, I'm going to start with uh, that it, well, again, I guess before you even answer, you should probably figure out which one, which of the documents goes with each answer. So, and this is kind of tough. Okay, so Fed 10 is, is in favor of a strong national government. Brutus 1 is against it. Okay, so which would be in favor of being able to amend the Constitution? I agree with you. I think it's Fed 10. Okay, the reasoning is, is again, if you think back to the Articles of Confederation, they were a weak national government with a that needed a unanimous consent in order to amend the Articles. That was that it was a weakness that they created. So I think that Fed 10 would be in favor of having the ability to amend the Constitution. So Brutus, if we so if we take the that it should be easier anyway, that's probably going to be a Brutus. I'm sorry, a Fed 10 question. Or a Fed 10 thing, and then if we take it that it shouldn't be amended easily, that would be a Brutus 1 argument. Okay, and the best part is that Article 5 can be used at any point in time, and that, that is really you should use Article 5. If it's asking about the amendment process specifically, you need to be able to uh, describe the amendment process. Um, again, and again, the amendment process is just something that I would really focus on anyway because it's in the Constitution, because it's a required document. Um, and it's honestly just good to know in, in general. Okay, so uh, do you guys have a preference on, on what route we take? Do you think, can you can you guess that there's an easier one? Can you tell if there's an easier one? Yeah, it, 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 there is an easier one here and it's, and it's definitely probably that, it sh that, that the amendment process should be made easier because Fed 10 more closely aligns with how, like the strength of the federal government. Um, if you took the Brutus route, that it should this should not be simplified. One thing I would definitely hit on is that there are two ways to propose and ratify an amendment. Okay, that that would be just something that I think would be really powerful to use. But again, I think that um, talking about simplifying it is going to be much better. So let's write our thesis. Um, oh, actually, hang on. So um, so for Fed 10. We are going to want, I, I would want to say, the thing that I always tell my kids is that you want to focus on a large and diverse republic helps to control the effect of faction. Okay, that is my one sentence, my one liner that I use for Fed 10. But in general, Fed 10 is going to be in favor of a strong national government. Okay, and so when, I, when I'm outlining here, I'm thinking Fed 10 in the context of a large and diverse republic that needs to be adaptable for the needs of citizens. Okay, so that is what I'm thinking for my first piece of evidence. Okay, so, and again, this is going to get kind of confusing, and you know what I might do, actually? Okay, children, we're going to actually write this out. Let's do it. Okay, so first up with our thesis, here we go. Oh, I don't like that color, though. We got to fix that. That's not going to work. Not the color. Okay, white. Good. There we go. All right, so here we go. Thesis time. Okay, so again, I want to, you want to use the same wording as... Uh, as, as the prompt, okay, so it says you would want to say um, the uh, amendment or the process to amend the United States Constitution should be simplified. Okay, so that's my answer. That's my claim, but I need a line of reasoning because, and I have decided that I, I, I want to say uh, because, uh, you know, something about uh, Fed 10 talking about this a strong national government. Okay, so it should be simplified because uh, because we need a strong national government. And um, I I didn't actually think about this, so I'm I'm gonna say the um, yeah I could say something about uh, and uh, the flexibility to change. Uh, or to, I, I guess, maintain, uh, or no, I'm, I'm just going to say, and in the, in the flexibility to uh, adapt and change to protect future citizens or future generations. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Google, for, for auto completing. Okay. Again, next part is going to be evidence one. Again, you see, I have my two things. Those are literally going to become my evidence one and two. So for evidence one, I'm going to go for, I'm going to talk about Fed 10 because I need a required document. 
And for evidence two, I'm going to talk about uh, just, excuse me, evidence two, uh, I'll talk about just kind of the amendment process in general. Okay, so here we go. And then I need to, I need a rebuttal as well. And again, this is how I would expect you to do it on yours. All right, so here we go. Evidence one, okay, I'll say in Federalist 10. How did you know I was going to say Federalist Google? That's ridiculous. Okay, so in Federalist 10, uh, Madison states that the best way to control the effect of or the effects of factions is a large and diverse republic. Again, that is true, that is evidence, but I, again, for your warrant, and as part of your warrant, you want to kind of go further. Um, you can say, like, uh, the, therefore, a, uh, a strong national government with the ability to uh, amend the governing document of the nation is key to helping uh i don't know or hang on so okay yeah so i i'm, I'm fine with this it is is key to protecting the rights of all citizens or something or again something like that okay so that's my let's say that that's my evidence i have linked now again it's specific it's relevant Okay, I, I mentioned the amendment process that establishes that relevant piece. Again, it is specific because I'm mentioning specific things from Fed from Fed 10. I need to do the warrant still too, so let's go ahead and do that. Again, you're looking for why is this a good thing, or why, or like why, why does this support the idea that the uh, that the constitute the way to amend the con the constitution needs to be simplified. Okay, so again, I'm going to show you a way to cheat. Okay, I know it's super ridiculous. Here we go. I want you to say this shows that, and then I want you to rewrite your thesis. Okay, this shows that the amendment process should be simplified because, um, and again, obviously I'm just writing this off the top of my head. I should definitely have been more prepared. I apologize, you all deserve better. Uh, should be simplified because uh, the strength of the of the national government is reliant on upon its ability to adapt uh, to new situations and changing times so the amendment process should be simpler to facilitate uh, the national government's power. Okay, so this is my warrant. And if you wanted to, if you wanted to also label this, um, you could, something you might do is like indent it maybe. I don't know. I, I you could label it if you wanted, um, but I, I don't know. The only thing I wouldn't do is I, I wouldn't label it and then get rid of the labels for the for the the argument essay because they might think that your uh your warrant was like if you like separated it they might think that it was like you're you were starting your next piece of evidence and you just want to be really careful with that okay um okay so the evidence two uh that i'm that i'm i'm thinking of here again and i i'm kind of flying off the cuff so I, one, th I, I, is there anything you guys can think of that are, and again, I know what I have something in mind, but is there anything you guys can think of that might help us uh, prove that the amendment process should be simplified? Okay, the equal rights amendment, what might be a good one, like a, an example of a failed amendment? What? We're not in rebuttals yet. No. But we're gonna do that later. Oh, yeah, no, sorry, not no rebuttal. I'm looking for evidence two right now. I could I could use Article 5, but I, I don't want to, I don't want you guys to get in the habit of just using the documents. So, like, I am going to, I'm going to pick something different. So, here we go, okay? Specific and relevant, okay, let's get to it. Okay, the, 
Um, okay, here we go. So over the um, 240 year history of the United States, the Constitution has only been amended 27 times with the last amendment coming in the 1970s. Uh, there have, uh, there, there, are, there are, are currently many uh, groups of people uh, in America that do not have true equality. Uh, for example, women make, uh, you know, 80 cents on the dollar to men. And, uh, you know, many minorities still face uh, discrimination uh, from, uh, I don't know, parts, uh, discrimination in many aspects of American society. Again, that is kind of that last part's a little bit general, but the fact that, that I have uh, that I talked about the fact that I talked about the specific thing there about the eighty cents on the dollar and like um, you know that that's that is specific. I think that that would kind of cover us for that one. Uh, you could even and, and again, I might even just steal your idea, uh, Nicole, about getting about the equal rights amendment failing. Um, that, that, again, I know that might be something else to talk about. I, again, I'm getting kind of wordy here. Um, so I, I, I don't know. You can, you can do it, but it's not, it's not going to be anything that's like super crazy. I think I'm just going to leave what I have here. Um, the, and so let, let, this is, again, this is not my best work. Again, the Equal Rights Amendment would have been something good to talk about as well. But let's go ahead and get to the warrant because I'm at an hour and 17 minutes. So this shows again my this is my warrant this shows that uh, the process to amend excuse me the constitution should be simplified because there are many groups that still uh that, that, that still or that are still fighting for equality however uh, the complicated process of amending the Constitution uh, has not allowed for uh, new equal rights amendments for those groups. Um, okay, I think that this is I think that this is fine here. Again, I kind of even mentioned like the equal rights amendment kind of. Um, I think that that's uh, that's a good. It, I'm 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 explaining that this is uh, again that this is what is going again what the problem then and, and the reason why it needs to be simplified. Okay, again, guys, that just kind of as a as a reminder, I uh, would just really you don't have to. This doesn't have to be perfect. You really just need things that make sense and are specific and relevant. That is exactly what I have here. Um, again, there's a lot of different approaches you could have taken with the evidence too. Uh, you know, you could have talked about the Equal Rights Amendment. You could have talked about the amendment process in general. You could have talked about divided government even. It would have been another great opportunity to take. Like getting two-thirds of Congress to agree on anything right now is going to be really, really difficult. So like another piece of evidence could have been the fact that there are there is more instances of divided government means that it is less likely to... Uh, you know, to, to pass an amendment. Okay, so that's that's a really good one. All right, so here we go. Let's rebut. Uh, I don't know if that's a word. Is that a word? Okay, so let's get to the rebuttal. The um, I, again, so you you want to you want to start in the same way. Uh, some might argue that, or some might say that the process to amend the Constitution should not be simplified. Okay, because again, so I've I've restated it now. Now I need to provide a, a little piece of evidence to not be simplified because, um, and again, there's a lot of ways you can can approach this here. Um, I would let's just say, um, 
gosh, if, because if the process is simpler, or how about this, I'm just keep it even, even simpler, because the amendment process, or the, or, uh, here we go, amendments to the Constitution were only meant to be the most important um, things and or most important rights and uh, liberties uh, that American citizens have. Uh, this is also I'll say like while this is true, uh, there are many groups that still do not have equality, women and, uh, you know, African Americans, for example, uh, and I'd say, I guess you can just say, uh, and there have not been sweeping actually let's just say let's just keep it as women because there have been amendments about african americans so that might weaken our argument here uh women for example and there have not been or has not been enough action from the federal government to protect the rights of these citizens, mostly because I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Not, not enough action from the federal government to protect the rights of these citizens. This is because the process to amend the Constitution is very difficult and should be simplified. Simplified to protect the rights of all Americans. Okay, crushed it. Okay. Should have definitely uh, outlined ahead of time, but again, I was just flying off the cuff because I thought oh, I'd be super cool. Um, guys, I, I think that that covers you. Again, remember the argument is going to take you the longest, but it, me, it matters just as much as the other four, or the other three, rather. So please, please, please make sure that you guys are checking out. Again, the, remember that Ms. Womack has the, the practice FRQs for you. Those are on, um, it's going to be similar to what I did here, uh, but it's going to have, you know, like some, some tips. It'll have some examples that you can actually write out. Again, if you want to send those to myself or Ms. Womack this weekend, I'm sure that we would love to stop whatever we're doing and give you some feedback. Otherwise, don't forget about your cram sheet. Uh, otherwise, guys, good luck to you. If you need anything, you guys are gonna do great. We love you guys. Uh, we'll see you soon, good luck.